thought by now we'd be able to buy a van. <laughs> that happen on campus and get the campus all thinking about a topic. This year the topic is the year of self and society, fuzzy boundaries and discourses. So today's discussion allows us to have a discourse about the fuzzy boundaries that happen between art for the purpose of self-expression and art as a social message. And so we're going to be looking at that through the eyes of our guest speakers. Uh, one of them is Brian Malaman. Brian is an artist. <laughs> Brian's work was on display here at Moorpark College in the fall and was so well received that when we came up with the idea for this panel and discussion, his name was one of the first that came to mind that we wanted to bring him back. Um, we also have two artists whose work they've been collaborating together. This is Karen Johansson, who <laughs> she has her MFA in photography from Cal Arts, and she is in our, our Moorpark College photo department, so if any of you are photography students, I'm sure she's quite familiar to you. And her partner is Adele Horn, who is a Cal Arts faculty. <laughs> documentary filmmaker. And then we also have, we're very grateful to have, Al Wynn. Where's Al? Al sitting in the back somewhere? No, I'm sure he'll be on his way back. Um, Al is one of our faculty here. He's part-time faculty, uh, full-time artist. And we are so fortunate at this college to have such an amazing, talented community here to teach you guys. Uh, you know, it makes me want to jump back and take his class. Uh, so I'm going to open it up to them. Each of them is going to talk about their work and the fuzzy boundaries between self and society and their work. And then after they present their work, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. So be thinking of what questions you might ask them. Write them down for yourself so that you can mention them later. And then we'll open up the conversation for you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
began thinking about making a film about cleaning and trying to talk to people about how they viewed that part of their life. Um, and um, one of the early kind of, um, I tend to look at a lot of different sources for inspiration. And I was looking through, I actually don't even know where I ran across this image, but it's a photograph made in the 40s by Georg Milly. And he did this by attaching lights to um, a woman's hands while she made a bed in a darkened space and did a time exposure. Um, and so you can see all of her movements um, around the bed. And it was actually a kind of a time and motion study for uh, the most efficient way to make a bed. And they did a whole series on efficient housekeeping techniques using these light patterns to, to look at how someone moved in a space. And I was really taken by this image because I thought, oh, it's so interesting to see something very common that I do daily, make the bed, but from a really different angle, the aerial perspective, and also compressed in time. So, you know, several minutes that it takes to make a bed is compressed into one image. And I thought, I kind of want to make a project that does that in some way, that gives us a different way of looking at something that's very much part of daily life for all of us, but that we actually don't talk about very much. Um, another kind of influence in making this, this film, which I'll show you some of in, in a moment, was um, the work of Merle later than the Kellys, um, which I ran across at the WAC exhibition that was in Los Angeles several years ago. She made this piece in 1969, it was called um, it was a manifesto for maintenance art. She wrote a manifesto about kind of all of the, the work that she did, um, changing diapers and doing dishes and changing the sheets and also being an artist and finding that those two parts of her life were really separate. Um, because you don't, it's not, a, it's not really an honored part of life, the cleaning and the work it takes to maintain life. I mean, we know that because of what people get paid who are professional cleaners, right? It's not, it's not a well-paid profession. It doesn't get a lot of uh, status in society. Um, but it needs to be done, and um, there's this kind of division between work that is really valued and work that's not valued. And so she said, I want to do uh, a performance piece where I'll actually clean a gallery space for several weeks as, as a work of art. And so she you know, <laughs> was given a gallery space and cleaned it and said, this is my performance piece. This is my work of art. It's to show the work it takes to actually maintain a space. Um, she actually went on later to do a really interesting performance piece in New York City where she shook the hand of every, um, uh, what do you call it, the people that collect the garbage, of every person in the municipality who collected garbage, which was like, you know, I don't know, a couple thousand. And she spent a year making, uh, doing a handshake with each one and thanking them for keeping New York City alive. Um, because of course, without that work of maintenance, life could not go on. I mean, it's actually really crucial to life. And yet, it doesn't get much status in society. So these were some of the influences and kind of inspirations. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit of, um, I ended up um, filming 15 people in the Los Angeles area who, um, and I filmed them cleaning their own houses. And actually, in a couple of cases, I filmed people who cleaned for a living, but mostly it was people cleaning their own spaces. Um, I tried to really get a broad range in terms of age, ethnicity, um, and, you know, and also kind of like whether they were single or living in a couple, et cetera, in a family. Um, so I'll show you just a little bit of this. Um, let's see. And then I'm also going to um, introduce the part that Karin and I worked on together, which came out of this. they might be interested in me filming, and then I'd come back on another day, and I'd film them. And, um, and then um, uh, I combined, you'll see at the end, the text from the interview shows up after you watch the filming. So the film is actually 90 minutes long, it's very slow, and it, the idea that it's very meditative and it really gets you into thinking, the idea that it really gets you thinking about your own process of cleaning, how, did, how what part of, of life does it play for you? Uh, so let me just show you some of this, and we can kind of talk over it.
So I have to admit, when I heard that Adele was making a movie about cleaning, I was thinking like, cleaning, really? And I could kind of see it on people's faces when they ask me what project I've been working on recently. And I say I've been working on taking photographs of people cleaning. It's not really a subject that people are jumping at thinking, wow, that's so interesting. But actually, the more time I spend working on this project, the more interesting I find it to be. Because I find all these different connections in all different cultural aspects, politics, art. And um, it really kind of grows on me, this project. And um, the thing that Adele was talking about before, about the value of the housework, it really reflects when you talk about what you're doing art about cleaning, like you can really see how, or feel how low status it has. <laughs> but it's been a really great project, and um, for me to work on, because I've been really interested in this. And um, I know that Adele, when she was shooting her film, that she was doing it from a kind of faraway angle, and her camera was static. So when we talked about me taking photographs, I wanted to go in and work more physical with the person and be more active with them while they were cleaning. So we got more sense of the physical aspect of cleaning. And also I wanted to <laughs> the, the repetition, the kind of boring aspect of cleaning. I wanted it to be very mundane photographs. I didn't want it to look something it wasn't. And um, I also wanted to kind of portray the way that trans-like um, the frame of mind people can get to when they're cleaning because they're so used to doing an action over and over again so they can just let their mind go ahead and think about other things or this person, she was singing the whole time <laughs> and entertaining herself. So we try to approach the photographs differently to kind of get a little bit different aspect of the cleaning. But what I did, I went, Adele had already shot most of what she needed for the film, so I went back to these people, I read their interviews, and then I went back to them and I kind of had an idea what kind of tasks they were performing, or if they had something they needed to do that day, I was just following you do, do that. So, so that's how I've been working with photographs. And uh, this is our website. It's a project that we have now decided to work on because we realized that everybody really wants to share what we talk about after a while when they have come over the idea of how boring cleaning sounds like as a project. They all start like wanting to share about their own ideas about cleaning and how they feel or how they learn about it. Or, messy it was in their house at one time or it's like you feel like there's all this because everybody can relate to this subject so what we thought is like okay we should have this website where we can start collecting people's thoughts and ideas about cleaning and um, we started when was it beginning of January yeah I think we yeah. started we also have a Facebook page that you can go online you can all come and share your stories here. The book that we have started working on also might, in the, we're not sure, but we might in the end also include these kind of stories from people. And we actually have postcards. If any of you are interested in um, sharing stories or images on the website, that's the, the interactive part of this that we hope to keep gathering stories. So we please come and get a postcard. Um, and um, yeah, we, I think we're running out of time. I think we're out of time, time but so thank you so much. If you come and talk to us. So it's, it's a film, it's a book, and it's a website. Yeah, it started with a film, and it's kind of growing into a multimedia, multi platform.
plugging in. Some of the image from the presentation, I'm a Mac guy. So figure sculpture, so I kind of have a more formal art background, and I've been doing figurative drawings as my sort of main art for a long time now. And um, moving to a neighborhood in Los Angeles called Highland Park, which is in northeast Atlanta, started to, started to change me. I got a studio there, and I sort of fell in love with the place. It's an amazing neighborhood. It has an awesome history, arguably the first art neighborhood in Los Angeles. And, um, reading about the history and getting to know the people, it's sort of become a part of my art and a part of who I am and an extension of what I do. So one of my first projects getting there was starting a gallery night. And Northeast Los Angeles at the time had a reputation of being a fairly rough neighborhood. There's, there was a gang problem, there still is a bit of a gang problem, but it's a lot better. But there was all these little independent gallery spaces, artist-run spaces that truthfully were doing the best stuff that I'd seen in Los Angeles. But they were all kind of from different scenes, from different schools, from different genres, so never really interconnected. And I, I was like the guy that would go to all the shows in the neighborhood and kind of go into the, from place to place, pretty much blown away by the art I was seeing right in my backyard, basically. So I got everybody together and I started a gallery night. And I ran it every second Saturday for six years, which was a pretty major undertaking. I didn't realize how much work it would be. But it was awesome, a really, really awesome experience. And it was an interesting perspective for me to be on the other side of the gallery, the gallery world, and sort of getting insight into what they go through and finding out you know, most of these people are as passionate about art as we are. 
and uh, just wonderful people doing this stuff. So that was a six-year project for me. And the organization Neela Art is still going, which is uh, awesome to me. So one of the other things in the neighborhood was this odd sign. It was on the corner of Avenue 58 York. It's an empty space. It used to be a gas station. It's actually, the, the gas station is in the Moonbee Reservoir Dogs. And the gas station is gone, but the sign is still here. And the sign drove me crazy because I just couldn't imagine that they could just leave this thing there. It's kind of a big intersection in the neighborhood, and it kind of offended me that it could just be left there. And no one cared, you know? So I kind of felt like it needed to be altered. <coughs> so I climbed up there, and I put form line here, art gallery. Form line here kind of is a great statement because it works on its own. You know, like this is where you're supposed to stand in line. But it also sort of represents what a gallery deals, which is form, line, and a gallery. So here. <laughs> so I thought that was sort of a fun play on words. And I needed to come up with something. It took me forever to come up with something to fit the spaces. <laughs> so that, makes sense. that took the longest time. And I'm afraid of heights. So being up on this ladder in the middle of an intersection, <laughs> it's really strange. So anyway, once that was done, it started me thinking about what is an exhibition space. And as an artist, I've always been kind of intrigued by the idea that we're supposed to be like rebels and independent thinkers, and we're supposed to make big changes and think big ideas. But the first thing you have to do to do all this stuff is submit. You have to submit for this show. And it seems submission goes completely against what we're supposed to do. So I started thinking of, what if everything is an exhibition space? What if everything is an opportunity? Which kind of leads you into the world of street art, which I've always sort of admired, but I had something against the destructive nature of it. And that's an argument, that's a whole other thing, and a, a valid conversation. But for me personally, there was a destructive quality to it that didn't fit. So I started thinking about what is something that you can do that is basically street art, or, or out there on its own, interacting with the community, rethinking exhibition spaces, rethinking what artists do, and move forward. So I kind of landed on, let's invite people to hang artwork on this fence. Let's start documenting everything that happens on this fence as a piece of art. So that's where I'm at right now with it. That was, from there, I gave it its own identity as a logo. So now, it's interesting, the Hollywood sign was an advertisement, everybody probably knows it was an advertisement for a real estate. So there is sort of a history to a sign becoming something greater than it is. And I thought, well, heck, I'm going to try to give this that sort of quality in a way and, and give it a, a personality of its own and a life of its own. So I created what is basically a logo for it, and I've been using that on different projects that I'm doing. Um, the first one being Draw Highland Park, which I created all these sketchbooks. Now the idea is that these sketchbooks are going to live on their own. So I pass them to somebody and that person does a drawing, and then they document on, on the Facebook page, I have a Facebook page to sort of, which is awesome, huh? to sort of keep track of all this stuff. And then that notebook passes to somebody else and passes to someone else. And it keeps going and they begin to live a life of their own. So what you can do is you can click on a link and download the cover. Once I got a bunch of them out there, now you can download the cover and you can make your own. And then you can start it going on its own. So it's perpetual. You kind of take it in and, and adjust it and do what you need to do it and make, your, make the project your own. And that's another sort of aspect of the work I'm trying to do, which is Coming in, living in sort of a viral world where things are adapted, you adopt and adapt, sort of. You adopt it as your own and then you change it and make it your own and move it forward. You see it happening with music. So these projects are designed to do that. You get the spark of instruction and then you move forward with it on your own and you can change it as you, as you please. And, and even the whole idea of this space, of this gallery, of sort of finding a, an, an overlooked space, which is what I really liked about the cleaning thing because sort of identifying these places in your life and these places in your world that you almost take for granted, that you overlook. And that's what this, that gas station corner was. It's a major intersection, but nobody noticed it. So I could kind of keep it, sort of. The owner might disagree, but, you know. So these are some of the drawings that started coming in. 
And there's a bunch of them on the Facebook page. And, and they just pop up every once in a while. Somebody will find the sketchbook, and they'll sit with it, and then they'll do a drawing, and they'll, and they'll post it. And it's so exciting to me to know that these things are out there having a life of their own. Um, and there's a few people who have sort of adopted them and sort of shepherd them around. They're very, very protective of them. You know, they're like, so-and-so has it, and they're still working on it, and i got to get it back. So <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. Um, another project is I went around to different poles around the neighborhood, and I just put them up on, on different poles. So you're standing on the corner, and there's a sketchbook there. And it, it has a pencil stuck in the top. So you can stand on the corner, and you can just draw something. And uh, I have stacks of these things now that are sort of ridiculous. But this was one of them I brought in as an example. But you can see somebody actually did something over the top of it, which I thought was pretty great. You know, they took the other cover off, but it still had drawing on it, so it, it sort of worked. You know, and you just got this wide variety of different crazy drawings. Life is a dream. You know, real Highland Park gang tags. Probably the only one that has a sketchbook. Well, unless you're in the gang, I suppose you probably do. But, you know, <laughs> you know, it keeps going on. Uh, a hot dog and a hamburger. <laughs> a little happy face. Some of them are ridiculous, and then you get, let's see, you know, you'll get the, the mix of the random crazy stuff. And then, like, you know, a bag of Cool Ranch Doritos, you know? <laughs> And then you get some kind of really cool, interesting stuff. Really out of the blue. And there's been a few of them that had started conversations about gentrification. And from page to page, it's different people chiming in. Almost like, I think people are used to it with Facebook and stuff, but people giving their input on, on what's happening in the neighborhood. So that's. Here's somebody working on it. Yeah, they're stumped when they see it, but they fall in love with it. No, I mean, just the conditioning. It is awkward. People make it work. <coughs> Another one of the drawings. Coldest beer in town, Highland Park. If you're ever looking for it, that's where it is. <laughs> There's the sketchbook cover again. <coughs> um, another project, which is called Find a Poem in Highland Park. Now, I think. I think an artist, I was recently, I was talking to someone and they said, you know, you're, you're more of an instigator than you are an artist. And I, and I kind of really like that. Because I think as an artist, you should be as much instigator <coughs> as artist. Maybe even a little bit more instigator. A creator, creator and instigator, a little bit blend of the two. Um, I, you know, the, the, the thing of object in motion tends to stay in motion. I think as artists, we're supposed to be the ones that set the object in motion, and then let it go from there. So that's kind of how I'm seeing an artist's function now. Well, hold on, let me talk to this. So the idea is find a poem in Highland Park. So you find a poem to get it out there. So you write it on a single, you know, you're walking around, there's lost dog posters all over the place in Highland Park. People lose a lot of dogs. So the idea of take a poem and just put it up in the neighborhood somewhere. So it's sort of the same thing with stumbling on the drawing pad. They'll just be standing on a corner and there's this poem on the, on, the, on the wall, on the pole, or on the wall, or wherever you find it. Um, garage sale method. There's also garage sales all the time. So what if you had signs like a garage sale sign that just had this odd piece of poetry on it, stuck on where, you know, you usually see them stapled to signs or out in front of houses. And then the new media method, which is just to add a poem to every posting locally. And, and keep it local. You can see the little logo down there, 50 New York Gallery Project. Um, <laughs> This was uh, left in a, a local uh, cafe right across the street from the sign, so inviting people to, to draw the sign. The non-existent grant from the Center for the Drawing of this sign. Just keep people like, what the hell is that? I, I love that feeling when you stumble on something, you just you don't even know what to do with it. You know, you're sort of, you're sort of left with it. Um, and, you know, this is a beautiful drawing. I, I couldn't believe it. There was a lot of really nice drawings in there. And this one, I just, just really love this. 
T-shirts. I did a, a lot of T-shirts. Um, so now, well, this is the most recent one. It's starting to start a, a holiday. Um, I kind of owned Second Saturday for a while with gallery night, so I want to create an event, once again, that's self-sustained, that people know it. But to stay in the neighborhood and be real local about it, and every, every Second Saturday is Love Highland Park Day, so you, you kind of have a day that you've given a different meaning to. So I'm going to keep promoting this and push it. I've only been doing it for a couple weeks. And, um, and it, it's catching on, and it's fun to see it go. Like, you'll post it, and it's like, boom, 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 boom. You'll see it getting posted in all different places, and it uh, and, um, takes on a little bit of a life of its own. And there's a few of them there that, yeah. The Autry Museum is a big deal in Highland Park. Somebody up? The Autry Museum sort of took over the Southwest Museum, and it's a big controversy because they said, oh, we're going to make it better, we're going to make it better. Then they took the whole collection and <coughs> haven't really brought it back. And everybody's like, hey, what'd you do with our stuff? So that's kind of on there, too, just to keep going on there. So then I was thinking, well, maybe it's not fair for me to have the only sign gallery in town. So I was like, what can I do so somebody else can take this idea and move it forward for themselves? So this is basically instructions on how to make any stop sign into an exhibition space. So you can cut out the bottom, you can do your art, you can roll it up and you can stick it in there, in the little holes, because every stop sign has those odd holes with the holes in it. So now when you come up to a stop sign, you can see all the little things hanging out there, you can pick them up, kind of check out the show. <laughs> the wind chimes one might actually happen pretty soon. One of the local businesses has really pretty much fallen in love with the idea. So it's a pretty big fence. So what if we could turn this giant fence into a wind chime? So it would require everybody to sort of hang a bell. The person that lives right next to it isn't equally as excited. That's okay. I just imagine how cool it would sound if all these little bells are ringing every time the, every time the wind blew. But it would require people to buy like 10 of them and do it on their own. But people are taking it up, so we'll see what happens in the next month or so. Um, Cut out words and leave them. You remember those little refrigerator magnets that each had a word on them? Yeah. So I'm like, well, what if we each made a word and just kind of hung it on the fence? And then people could come by and move it around. And it opens up some fun. I, I, it's just neat to see where it goes. Part of what I want to do is give this space a feeling of potential and begin looking at un, unused spaces. Like think an artist thinking of possible exhibition spaces instead of gotta get a gallery, gotta get a gallery, gotta get a gallery. Okay, what are possible exhibition spaces? Where can I go to show my work? How can I do this on my own? I came up in music and playing in bands, and we never waited to be asked. We just said, let's have a show, find a space, get a couple other bands, and let's have a show. We'll even charge at the door. You know, which artists don't think that way, and I wish they did. Really, I wish they did. And I'm, I'm hoping to make people think about space different, think about exhibitions different, and even if. The, the, the concept itself, like maybe this doesn't take off to have a museum all over the place, but just changing the way people think about stuff is, is always been interesting. And um, that's it. Um, but I have all these printed out. I don't know if there's enough for everybody. But I'll pass them around, and you can share them as you like, or throw them away. Or do a drawing on the back, post it on the Facebook page for the gallery. We have here Facebook page. It's 50 in York Gallery. It's on there. It's on the bottom. I just want to pass some of these around. Or we can pass your cards as well. Yeah. Okay. If you want one, take one and then pass it. I'll keep the rest of them if you want
about art and about expressing your art and your message. And so some of you in in some of these shots, you might see things that might be shocking. And so you have permission to not view those things. And this is your opportunity to take that permission. This is like a little child message that says, well, this might not be appropriate for children. Um, but it's art and it's a message. And so we would be able to look at it as a message and not just
decades of uh, study, um, photographic studies. Um, and I, uh, in sort of in contrast to what uh, Nixon was doing, um, I was interested in not only showing my uh, entire life, um, but also uh, trying to um, get away from the notion of just being just sickly. Um, and then what I also realized is that the photographs were just not enough, and that I needed some stories to go along with it. And um, so this is, for instance, is a part called My Name, and refers to how I got my name. Um, and uh, then I began to add other photographs to it that were, um, that I took from, that I didn't take these, but ones that were family photographs and adding them to, uh, to the work. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure how whether every single photograph needs a description, but um, part of the the idea was that I wanted to um, again show the entire as entire as, as many aspects to my life as possible, um, and also addressing the uh, the. Uh, the relationship of myself as a gay man and then adding that on as a uh, person with AIDS in the family construction. Um, <coughs> while still also always going back, uh, making reference to illness. Um, here, and then again, like I said, there were aspects. Now these, these these text pieces that you see here are just uh, excerpts from much lar larger stories. And then there was also um, when a time when uh, the, the work began to have um, uh, spoken word uh, sort of performance um, aspects to the, to, so when the work was exhibited, I would also do a reading um, or writing of the, uh, and read the, the entire, uh, all the stories. Um, it's difficult to, like I said, to go into every single one, but some of, some of the work has uh, a title, for instance, this one is called, uh, in Hebrew, it's called Akedan, refers to the binding of Isaac. And it was really as a way for me to try to um, make a, uh, to try and make sense of what it was like to be having uh, 13 vials of blood being taken from my body every day for various kinds of testing. This is at the height of the epidemic. Or getting to the point where I was um, Treating myself uh, with uh, not some—I mean, something that was prescribed uh, uh, for me—and then um, where I, in about in, in the late '90s, about ten years after I was uh, diagnosed, when um, the cocktail of drugs was uh, came along, and uh, for instance, I. This is this photograph was called after the cocktail, um, where things uh, changed for me and many other people with AIDS, and then uh, the work began to change into a sort of shifted gear because what happened was no longer was I considered sick. I was then became something known as a long-term survivor. And learned, trying to figure out how to negotiate what that was like, where I was now going to be, it seemed that I would be surviving um, where I was the one who was supposed to be uh, dying, um, where I was out 
beginning to outlive, um, in this case, my dog, but in other cases, other people who were dying of other causes. Um, uh, for instance, friends who <coughs> died from breast cancer. Um, and at the time, this was the uh, sort of the last bit of the, the last section of the, of the original stories, which was called Until Now, um, in which I witnessed um, a young girl uh, who uh, killed herself. And um, do I need to read this? Here, where again, where the things began again, another a sort of strange um, the a aspects of being a long-term survivor, where uh, it, where the emphasis for those of us who were surviving now not became more than just of uh, just surviving, but became issues of of uh, of appearance. So. Uh, where treatments were then developed to improve our, for in this case, where I went through facial reconstruction to correct some of the prop, some of the, uh, the effects of the, that the disease had left on my face. Um, so then I started working on this other a uh, project called the Band-Aid Series. And this was really in response to the fact that, as you can see from some of the photographs, my body took on a, a, almost a whole different appearance. I went from being emaciated to really actually being rather robust. Um, and people were saying to me things like, aren't you glad it's over? And um, which struck me as rather strange because AIDS is not over. Um, but what I realized is that I was walking around with these invisible scars. That pe and so I decided to put a Band-Aid on various parts of my body wherever there had been some manifestation of illness, either uh, where something had either been taken out of me or put in me, or there had been some as I said, manifestation, whether it was some kind of uh, opportunistic infection or skin problem, whatever it was, that was caused by the illness. Um, and I made these photographs so that they would, on, on a copy stand, which is ordinarily used for copying flat art, but also I wanted them to look a bit like forensic photography is in the sense of evidence, but also they were meant to to represent the motion studies of Edward Moybridge. For those of you who uh, know about photo history, Edward Moybridge was the one who per performed those studies of, uh, of uh, motion studies of people doing different tasks and horses. Uh, there was one famous thing about horses. And, we'll, and um, because I realized that when people would walk up to me and they'd go, oh, you look so good. And I thought, well, you know, that's really nice to hear. Um, but it also is a statement like that is a form of measurement. It's like saying, oh, you're so thin. You know, because what they're saying is that's because you used to be not so thin. <laughs> or, you know, you look so good, it means, well, because you didn't look so good before. So um, I thought, OK, well, I need something to, to as an indication of measurement. So I put these. I uh, photographed myself on, on, in, this, um, in this grid. <laughs> How are we doing for time? Oh, you're way over. Good. You're <laughs> five minutes over. I'm um, five, five minutes over. So, yeah. All right. Um,
I'll just go through the rest of these pretty quickly. I just something. Um, <clears throat> Did you start to buy different band-aids or different books of your hood? No. Anyway, I did another project, um, a couple of other projects, I'll go through these. But the, this last project uh, was, was about deserted and abandoned summer camps because I needed a, what I was again looking for, uh, Jewish summer camps where I needed, I was looking for a place to represent the sense of loss and, um, uh, and yet the same kind of thing that would uh, reflect on the world that existed uh, before AIDS, uh, a place that was uh, that was built for happiness, um, that was about experimentation and um, joy and creativity, but uh, would represent uh, a sense of nostalgia and loss. So I found these sites uh, throughout the United States uh, of these deserted summer camps. And um, and I'll end with this. And again, again, another story, um, which was called The Summer of South Pacific. And it says, I don't know what other people were thinking. Maybe they were remembering singing on the bus, or canoe trips, or a kiss, or just wandering where all, wondering where all the years had gone. Weddings have a way of doing that. As for me, my mind turned to all those who were left behind. All the friends whose season had passed. I found myself thinking of Stephen and the life we shared in New York of Nathan and Renee in their over-the-top apartment in the San Remo, of Philip and James's memorial service at St. Bart's, or of Peter and his advice when I was struggling to come out and his phone call when he told me he was discontinuing his treatments, of Hal and his drumming at fairy gatherings, as his, his postcard art and his dementia, of Simon and his memories of Israel. I ran through a list of people who had all died and with whom I would never have a happy reunion or celebrate their long years together as a couple. These memories were as secret as my memories of studio. And honestly, when I first fell in love with the neighborhood, and then I got really scared of it. 
Then I met my friend Claire, who has this amazing collection of stuff. And when we started gallery night, he said, I'll just open it up. And here's this neighborhood that I was afraid to walk in at night. And he's opening up his entire collection of everything he has for everybody to walk through. And in the six years that we did <coughs> gallery night, more stuff actually showed up. People gave stuff to the collection. Nothing was ever taken or damaged. And it, this, these events were at night. And I, it's amazing. I think, I think we're afraid of each other. Too, way too afraid of each other. But uh, theft, not at all, actually. I, I, it's, I, and that's part of the piece, in a way, too, is opening it up to be taken on. And you know, it's kind of interesting. I'm not even sure if this is art yet or not. I mean, I have my regular studio practice, and this is something that I'm doing, and I haven't really found a place for it yet. But it, it's, it's, you know, so it's, it's there to be stolen. <laughs> so, so No, I mean, it's originally vandalism in a way. I mean, the original piece being left there without care or concern for the neighborhood and the look of the, the people that live there, just this ugly thing being left there, to me, that's vandalism in the first place. So by altering it, arguably, that's vandalism too. So there's vandalism inherent in it, in a way. So, and, you know, I mean, mark making is mark making. So if somebody adds a mark to it, in a way, that's part of the work. Yeah. Have you ever uh, thought about making a book almost like post secret? Like the website? Um, for me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm working on, I have all these sketchbooks right now. I don't even know what to do with them. I'm um, working on a show. I don't know where this is going, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, so I'm kind of moving forward with different ideas and um, trying to document as much as I can, if it even matters. You know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it'll be interesting to see where it takes. I think it's an important thing to do, to follow things that are may seem ridiculous and let it know, let it take you where it needs to take you. And the video about making it. Filmmaker, but in, we staged things as well. So you know, I talked with that couple, Clinton and Christine, and said, you know, okay, they said, okay, well, let's let's film us, you know, getting our laundry together, doing the laundry, and then he's cleaning the bathroom. And so we really kind of figured out where I could be. And um, what I've noticed with making documentary films is people start to just forget about you after a while, you know. So they and we already met and spent a lot of time talking, doing the interview, and so they were pretty comfortable. And actually, Christina is an actor. And Clinton folks back to too. So actually, they were really good at kind of knowing how to just be there and not think about the camera. Um, so some people took a little longer to get more comfortable. But yeah, they're they're very much aware of the cameras there. And, and how long were you able to how long were you able to view the entire video? You know, it's not viewable online at the moment. I may I may do that eventually. It's it's a film that's much better to see on a big screen. So I'm kind of <coughs> hesitant to put it online because. Um, I like the monumental size. I think it gives this kind of like power to this very mundane task, and also the, the sound as well. Um, and uh, it's going to screen up in Toronto at the Images Festival <coughs> next month, and I'm hoping to s schedule something in LA sometime soon. Are you so any I'll post on the website. No, no. But I will post on the website. I'll post any any other events or screenings. Yeah, I'll put on the Facebook page. Also. <coughs> Well, it was funny because actually we really had to beg people to <coughs> clean before we came yeah. to film <laughs> and photograph. You know, and I'd show up and it'd be like, hmm, this is your house really dirty? <laughs> wow, okay, looks pretty good. Um, so it was actually hard to get people to really do that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you 
realize how personal and, and uh, how much issues people have with their own cleaning because once when you showed the film at Polaris, there was so many of the people who was in the film there in attendance <coughs> and everybody felt so embarrassed about how their house looked or how they did things and it was like well i didn't think your house was the worst but they, everybody really thought that their place were the dirtiest. So it really shows how much issues we have around this thing about having a dirty home or having it clean. Or it's just interesting. I mean, I couldn't see any difference. And like you said, it was always kind of spotless. It was one or two times I came to somebody and it was actually really messy. But otherwise, they really had. Because it is so personal. It is something that you really you don't want to yeah. I guess there's a use that we shouldn't show our dirty <laughs> It was actually interesting doing the interview. I mean, the interviews were really fascinating because you realize that cleaning, it's kind of like, it's like money in a certain way. Like there's so much wrapped up in it. It's a, it's a very basic part of life. We don't think about it that much, but there's a lot of emotion and history and, and family history wrapped up in it. And a lot of people's current cleaning practices very much relate to what it meant in their family to clean or not clean and how, you know, the arguments, the scolding, whatever that went on with it, or whether it was fun and, you know, kind of it reveals a lot about a person. A lot of the interviews, or parts of the interviews, are on the website, and yeah, a lot of them are really interesting. So it's possible to go there and read some more. Um, <coughs> besides anything outside of that, like personal hygiene, or like car cleanliness, or like things? We did, and I, I think we kind of decided to keep it, keep it inside like cleaning maintenance of the home because um, you could yeah you could get into yard that? work you could get into the car actually as one of the people we didn't did it do car work but we also tried to do also that we're representing people who's cleaning other people's houses mm -hmm. so it becomes even though it is in the sphere of the <coughs> home it's someone else's home so yeah. but we haven't been <coughs> We did feel like we had to just, we didn't want it to, it could, it could spread out like that and we didn't want to take certain I'm curious how you found the people to participate? It was all friends of friends um, because um, it's funny, people, yeah, it's very difficult to have someone come and film the cleaning. It's very intimate. And so we tried, at some point I was really trying to get some younger people actually, like in their early 20s, and I, I had a student intern helping me and I said, go. Go and like you know this campus and ask students to help do this. And you know she couldn't get anybody to. <coughs> just cold. So it has to be you know. But if I said if someone one of my uh, friends or former student or something said oh well I have this neighbor and they you know they're interesting they might be interested in doing it because the neighbor knew them and liked them and trusted them and that person knew and liked and trusted me. You know by extension well, a friend of theirs is okay. So it really had to be. It was tricky to do. Yeah, actually, she just asked the same question I was going to ask. So. Yes. Um, I, just, I just have kind of a statement. When I'm talking to the second gentleman, when um, you were saying that when people say, wow, you look really great, you know? And, and I was thinking when I was watching the slides, the minute I saw you then be kind of buff, I was like, man, looks really great. And I went, oh, shit. Now if I would have said that to you, then you might have take a harm to that. But in, in my mind, I'm thinking in blur images when you're frail and you just see bones, I just saw shin, so that's, it's not even the time, but, but you're seeing somebody's, in, in my opinion, not necessarily somebody that's sick but, or that has AIDS, but somebody that their body is lacking 
nutrition. They're basically just throwing them away. And then when you start to see this regrowth of muscle mass and weight gain put on, and, you know, you just think, oh, that's great. You must be doing better. Not necessarily in my mind, he's asking a disease or yeah. an ailment necessarily. So I, I don't know how to take that. So I will be careful about the way, you know, I might address somebody with their personal appearance, you know, in the future. But, um, I think it's the same thing with any disability that's not seen necessarily that um, when people have learning disabilities, they don't have a, um, a wheelchair to show you have a disability, but yet you're going forward and people still are judging you by how you act or you don't act. But yeah, I, I, I probably would, the, the presentation did make um, an impression on me as far as the way um, I address people. Yes. Uh, this is for Albert. Uh, first and foremost, I think you're an absolutely incredible photographer. Um, your summer camp abandoned project was just touched my heart so deep. It was just reminding me of my past and the memories that I had when I was a child. And just seeing everything, just not there anymore. Just the emptiness, the the darkness, everything about it just, there's emotion in there that just really comes out of you, especially if you've been or experienced a uh, summer camp. And to see it just not there anymore and, and just gone, it's just, it's amazing. You captured a really incredible moment. And I just want to know, did you, did you ever shoot, did you go to a summer camp when you were a child? And did you go and shoot uh, your camp? Is it abandoned as well? Or, or is, that, is that just, uh, I'm a lifer. <laughs> Started camp before I could read. <laughs> I went for two whole months every summer to the Poconos. Um, and uh, uh, some of the photographs are from the camp that I, I went to. Um, but the camps are, but they're from a variety of camps, mostly in the Northeast, but uh, in different, but, but also there are camps from all over the United States, but primarily in the Northeast because that is sort of like where the, the whole camping movement started and where camps really were. Um, but yeah, I went for two months until I, every summer, uh, up until the time I was about um, 16 or 17. Well done. I enjoyed your work. That was uh, part of the work um, because I thought that uh, you know I think that when you when you haven't when you have uh, a, an illness particularly an illness like AIDS particularly at the time there was um, uh, in a sense it. it it's, it's a very depersonal, depersonalizing experience, um, and you become the illness, and you lose your identity. Um, and so, uh, I had, you know, I, I thought that the, then I, I need to get in there and show some emotional aspects, of, like, in a sense, and more of a, a whole per uh, a person is there and a whole person. Um, 
people that you interviewed, I'm interested in if you found any differences between the way that men and women felt about cleaning, the anticipation for the expectations of society. I know in my own home, I feel like my husband and I, we both work full time, but I feel like if people come over, I'm like, the house has to be perfect. He's like, mm, who cares? It doesn't matter. I'm like, no, it's like a reflection of me. I'm the woman. The house is my, you know, I hate it. And I'm like, oh, I hate cleaning. So it's like, I don't know if you found that other women felt that way too, and then we're just kind of like, oh, it's fine. I mean, it, it wasn't as clear cut as that. I think there's there's a lot of variation when there's messy and clean men and women. Mm -hmm. But you were actually just looking up the statistics that you had there yeah. about women still do a lot of cleaning. <laughs> yeah, they I mean, do. Yeah, I mean, women still clean about one and a half hour longer per day than men. That, I mean, of course, this is statistics, so mm -hmm. it's not everyone, but. Um, so it changed, I mean, it has changed. I think this study was from 2010, and they started in 1965, and in 1965, women seemed like six hours a day more than men. But of course, it was also a different um, Now it's more the second shift for women, because they first go out and work, and then go out and do the cleaning, so. But it's, yeah. But I think what we have noticed is the people who submit things online is mostly women. Yeah. So far. Yeah. People we don't know at all. Is there another question? Yeah. What I wonder is if, so we're, we're, we're wrapping up, which is why we're trying to put a box here so I can have her find her website. Um, and I wonder if you might want to. Is there a final thought that you would like to leave with the students about your work or about that intersection of self and society in, in art um, as we close? I mean, one thing I'm thinking about in terms of all the work in common is just um, I really enjoyed, I thought they were really wonderful projects and pieces, and uh, just this idea that, that creating space and creating um, the action of, of documenting your own life, um, other people's lives, inviting other people to document and express themselves is, is really the function of art. And it's um, it's something that really I think only artists do in that way. And we have such a commercial, commercially driven society where um, kind of like personal experience and daily life and uh, simple lived experience is often not you know, it's not an action movie, or it's not <laughs> something that sells, you know, it's not like that. It's not easily to modify. It's not easily to modify, right. And so I think that's really the function of artists to, to bring that to light and to reflect it back to people. I think, personally, I think we're really in an exciting time for artists, because I think there's so many artists that are reinventing presentation, exploring different ways of connecting and interacting with people. And it's opened up a lot of doors for um, subject matter, too. And I think looking across just this group of us here, um, as an artist, really focus on what, <laughs> pay attention to what you're not paying attention to. Look at what you may not be noticing. And it's amazing the art that you find there. And you know the, the Band-Aid pieces for me were just really powerful. Having grown up in, in the 80s, and age was really, really scary. And everywhere, it was everywhere. And it is sort of almost like a, a something from a past time now. And I think those Band-Aid, Band-Aids for me really hit home. But you know, something so subtle can have so much power to it, and if you pay attention to it, you can find it. I guess that's fine. Word.
Webspace.net slash the year of. Is it the or is it just the year? Yeah, the year of. All one word. Um, so MCWebspace.net slash the year of. This lecture is being video and will be available online. And we will have a place where you can continue the conversation. So, it, you know, sometimes you leave something and you go, you know, I wish I had asked. So you'll have a chance to post, post to the blog, keep the conversation going, keep, keep the ideas flowing, and communicate your thoughts. So, so, so thank you so much for presenting today.